Erica Engel has had a unique journey in the STEM industry, from being former Miss Massachusetts, studying at BU School of Medicine at MIT, hosting an educational science TV show, to being the founder of multiple STEM organizations. You know, my experience was very sort of different. Um, I'm, I'm a scientist by training. Um, you know, I, I had to learn a lot of the other skills. There wasn't like a class at MIT that I took that taught me about management or finance or um, fundraising or even, you know, how to run a business or how to start a business. So it's it's been kind of a, a learning experience from the get-go. Um, when I started Science from Scientists, I did so because I've always been driven by giving back to the community. I think it it stemmed from childhood. My parents were both immigrants who came to the U.S. They didn't have a lot when they got here and built a reasonable life for themselves. And I think always reminded me from the very beginning how important it was to give back. You know, when you're when you're fortunate enough to do so, you have an obligation to do something to try to make the world a better place. And so, you know, it, it started there. Then it was a question of, okay, well, how did that happen? So I started volunteering at a very young age at a local community center, teaching kids science, teaching kids math, teaching kids English, anything really, you know, on a center where, you know, most of the parents who sent their kids here, they couldn't afford traditional tutoring. So, you know, we were volunteers and this was kind of middle school, you know, this, this was many, many, many years ago. So I'm talking about, you know, I was 13 years old when I started there. Um, I taught piano lessons as well a couple times a week because I, I love music. And um, I loved the experience, the experience of watching people who kind of were like, eh, I don't like that. I don't want to do that. I'm not good at that. Suddenly realize that they can be good at it and giving them that confidence to be able to go and say, yeah, you know, math, that thing. Yeah. You know, that's okay. I, I'm okay. And I, I'm okay with that. And often as you build confidence, you know, we have a tendency to dislike the things that we're not good at. So when you build confidence, they're kind of like, yeah, okay, I can do this. And it's not so bad after all. And, you know, so I did that through middle school and high school, um, sort of concurrently was a super science dork. Love science. Um, science, you know, I don't know. I, I always just, I liked it. Um, there was, I think when I was 11 or 12, Michael Crichton's book, Jurassic Park came out. And that was like my favorite book for a long time. They turned it into a movie. It was all about you know genetics and cloning and science. And that sort of got me reading other books on science. Um, started working on an independent science fair project when I was pretty, you know, pretty small. I was again, you know, seventh, sixth, seventh grade. That ended up continuing throughout middle school and high school. And so I think the idea of giving back to the community coupled with my love of science, um, you know, when I went off to MIT, because that's where, you know, all my role models, the other super science dorks that I <laughs> looked up to, um, we, where we all, everyone went to school, when I ended up there and was sort of looking for a community service project to get involved in, I couldn't find anything that scratched the itch in the right way. And so I tried, you know, volunteering at the hospital, um, you know, usually given like a desk job and you like point to where the bathroom is and the building and the cafeteria and none of it brought me enough kind of satisfaction. So that's where the question is, all right, I like science. I like teaching. I like kids. What can I do with this skill set that would ultimately bring this love of science that I have myself to others. And so that's how SciSci ultimately got started, right? Where you're like, okay, I want to start something where I'm going to be able to go out in the community and share my love and skill with others, you know, who I think could, could benefit from it. And everything starts out small. I was the only one, there was no money, there was no budget, um, you know, and over time it was built into something you know, significantly bigger than than that. And, and that, you know, that's its own journey. But it starts with, you know, why are you doing it? What are you passionate about? And that was my passion. I, I wanted to give back and doing so under a structure, I think was also very motivating for me, because once there's structure, and there are other people involved, you kind of have to do it. So it, it, it created a, um, an urgency 
and accountability to have, you know, a business. Suddenly it's like, okay, I have a business. Like I gotta, I gotta do this. I can't just talk about it because people talk, 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 talk. Um, and then once you have that, then the next question is, you know, what am I doing? Who is my audience? Um, how do I scale it? How do I find, you know, staff? How do I raise money? And those are all skills that then you have to learn as you decide that you want to be a, an entrepreneur and business owner. Um, each one, we could spend an hour talking, you know, probably a week talking about, you know, the what it takes to do. But I think it starts with, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And what makes you different from all the other people out there trying to do it? And once you get there, then the rest, it's some of it is just the pieces start to fall in place as you learn the skills that it takes to push things forward. The nonprofit organization sends real scientists into classrooms to inspire young children through hands-on STEM lessons in schools in California, Massachusetts, and Minnesota. So the mission is to get third through eighth grade students excited about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, you know, we use the words attitudes and aptitudes, right? So how do you get these kids to actually be excited about the content? So that's the attitude and the aptitude. How do you actually teach them something that is, you know, it's this isn't just playing in the sandbox. Yes, we want them to walk away having learned real, true, pedagogically taught science, Um but at the end of the day, we also want them to love it. So it's improving attitudes and aptitudes in, you know, students, um, grades three through eight, and really expanding the community's appreciation and understanding about science. You know, I, I was reading this morning. I've just I, I decided reading the news is like something you shouldn't do more than a couple times a day. But, you know, that ocean water temperature has exceeded 100 degrees off the coast of Florida you know, corals are dying, fishes are dying. Like we have serious global issues, um, you know, pertaining to the environment, pertaining to healthcare and to, I mean, there's just pick a topic. Um, and science is the answer, you know? So how do we get the community, the children, their families to appreciate the significance of what this is and how important it's going to be to like the survival of our planet. Um, you know, so that's, I think it's, you know, get them to like it, be interested, pursue it, teach them real science that they can sink their teeth into, but also just increase community awareness. Because I do think that, you know, there are people who just don't know, they don't understand why this is important. So, you know, SciSci goes into schools to do work, but we also, are in the community at Red Sox games or at Disney or right, because there's a larger population of people, many of whom are not educated and do not know why this stuff is important and how can you open their minds to this and, you know, to get them to understand why science is so important. Their focus is elementary and middle schools due to the shortage of science teachers, the lack of hands-on labs available and the limited exposure to professional role models in the field. You know, I think that depending on which community and the demographic, you know, like I said, a lot of people don't understand what careers are out there. What does a scientist do? You know, maybe they've never met a real scientist. You know, if you live in certain communities, you don't have role models who are even doing that. It's not even brought to your attention that this is a career that you could even have. So I think there's a bringing live, real you know, scientists with real lives, you know, and diverse personalities and backgrounds, bringing them into the classroom to show like, this is what a scientist does. This is, you know, and these are the career opportunities that are available to you, um, you know, teaching real science. So again, many of the schools that we work with are, are struggling. They're, the classroom teachers are not scientists by, by training, by background, especially at the elementary school level. Um, and they, will often say that they need help. They don't have the experience themselves to be able to bring this topic to life. So, you know, they'll Xerox stuff from books or they'll, you know, they, they will they will do things that don't always like ignite that fire. Um, and they will say that. And I, and again, it's not their fault. It's just the way that the system has prepared and trained them. They're expected to teach everything from, you know, humanities to math to science to like whatever else there you know is on their plate and it's very difficult to imagine like like my teaching french literature it would make no sense i don't have a background in that so um 
you know, I, I think it's the program is unique in that we're trying to send real scientists into the schools to work with the children, to work with the administration, to work with teachers, to bring real content in so that it, you know, again, opens the minds of these these students to the content, but also to the opportunities that are available to them out once they, you know, go go forward and graduate and go to college and have to make real career choices. You know, I do think that as a society, again, when we talk about the STEM crisis, not enough people are pursuing STEM careers. So there isn't a, a pipeline of of individuals in the workforce. So, you know, like a biotech company will say, well, we can't hire, you know, people who have this skill set. We, we can't find them or um, programmers like computer programming. It's, it's like an absurd, if you, it, I am a huge proponent of telling everyone go become a programmer because they get out of college, make a ton of money and are incredibly highly sought after. So, um, you know, there's a, a challenge where employers can't find the proper talent that they need in order to, you know, keep our world going. So I think, you know, size, size mission and purpose is to, of course, try to get everybody to want to be a scientist. Yes, but also to just enlighten students about the opportunities that are out there, encourage them to at least take a look at it, and then to walk away from the program with an appreciation of some of the softer skills, things like communication. You know, people think you're a scientist, you're a crappy communicator. It's not the case. You know, you, you have to learn how to explain to people what you do and why it's important. Um, you know, so again, teaching them teamwork, how to work in teams, why is it important to be able to, you know, divvy up responsibility? Well, because the more responsibility you have, you can't do it all yourself. So there are these softer skills, critical thinking, communication, um, you know, teamwork, uh, you know, problem solving, whatever else. These are skills that are built into our lessons with an attempt to try to teach them because we know not every child is going to want to go and become a scientist, but at least they can walk away having learned some of these life skills. It's going to make them be a more, uh, I don't want to say useful, but like a more participatory human being in society, right? We want we want everybody to be able to have a positive um, impact when it comes to being part of part of the, the 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 royal brain trust. And how would you define uh, impact in your work? It would be nice to have all these children be inspired and want to go and solve all the world's problems by becoming scientists. but I I think realistically, right? You're not going to, every child we've touched, hundreds of thousands of them at this point aren't all going to become scientists, but they can become contributing members of society who value some of these important responsibilities that we take on by being stewards, you know, on this planet. And so how do we get them to be like, Yes, this is a problem. Or I yes, I can go and I can put this plastic bottle, you know, in the recycling bin instead of just throwing it away. Or, you know, how can we get them to um appreciate and understand an engineering sort of protocol and approach to life, which it's not just like we teach this stuff because it's like you're supposed to take a test and, and answer it. You're supposed to apply these principles to your life, right? You see something. And you get to decide, is that reasonable? Should I just believe what I've been told? Or should I ask questions? Should I dig in a little deeper? Should I research it a little bit more? Right? Because I feel like we've become kind of like this herd mentality where everybody gets told all this stuff and everybody just, you know, listens to one track and has a one formulated one track opinion about things. And wouldn't it be nice if if these children could be like, let me ask you a question about that, <laughs> you know, and have an open mind and really look at what's going on and start to, you know, parse out. I hate to use the word truth, but parse out what's going on because we we just have lost the ability to do that. Ask questions, you know, dig in, understand, um, and, and, that's what we're trying to teach, right? The skills of thinking that way where you're like, okay, you know, I've just been given this problem, but 
before I just jump in and like just do the work to fill out the handout, what am I being asked to do? Why is this important? Who is affected by it? Right. And we have a great lesson called saving the beach where we talk about beach erosion. And we ask the question, you know, who are the stakeholders who stand to lose something if this happens? And, you know, typically like kids will give the same kind of response, right? Oh, the animals or, um, you know, of course, if you show them a picture of like Malibu beach in California, they're like houses, people, um, right? So if you're, if your house ends up in the ocean, but there's a whole, there's industry right around it. There's fishing and there's animal life and there's, you know, construction and there's like in, in all of these things are impacted and influenced as a result of this one thing that happens. Um, and it, again, it helps them to understand it's not so simple to just say, oh yeah, it's just the animals or it's, you know, it sucks for those people who lost their homes, but it's, it's an entire industry supporting it that is affected. And again, teaching the ability to think that through, I think is extremely important in this day and age. The goal is to change the narrative of the STEM crisis and continue bringing in more children to join science from scientists. I mean, our, our goal right now is to scale the organization. So we're last year, we were in 101 schools. There are about 13,000 children in the program, not counting some of the partnerships. So when you start adding in like Disney and Red Sox and stuff, the numbers obviously skyrocket, but it's a different kind of engagement because it's more of a, a one-off. Um, but, you know, my goal is to try to bring as many children as possible into the program. So uh, you know, whether it's expanding to new regions, whether it's growing in the current regions. Um, and, you know, how do you bring science to the forefront of, you know, it, it's been very tricky. Science has been highly politicized in the last, you know, I mean, really even more so in the last five years, but it's always been sort of politicized. And it's very tricky because so many of the important topics that need to be addressed, right? I mean, our planet is burning. I mean, it's just an example, just because it's in the news all the time, right? Um, how do we get people to understand this is important? And how do you take it away from being a political issue to just being one? It's like, look, we're all affected by it. I don't care about your politics. This is relevant. This is your life right? This is our planet. We all live here. Um, so, you know, again, how do we reach audiences that are hard to reach, but in many ways might need our services more than others? Um, so, you know, who? how do we get this out there? How do we reach more people? And we've talked about doing that through you know, virtual programming, through programming with, you know, some of these more Again, I call them one off, but like, you know, a, a science day at the Red Sox or a science show at Disney or whatever, because at least in that moment, you have lots of people's attention and you get them thinking about it. So, you know, I think my my goal is scaling. How do I scale this thing to make it bigger, better and, you know, reach more people in a more impactful way? <laughs>